is, let's see. So we're at the 23rd, 24th verse. And that he might make known the riches of his glory. Now I have to apologize because, you know, we break this teaching up. If you're not here in the morning, you miss half of what the theme is here. So uh, not much we can do about that unless we just preach right straight through, you know, from, from skip lunch and go right into. So we have to uh, kind of collect our thoughts after what we've learned this morning. Well, the ninth chapter, uh, it's really not much, much of a mystery. The Westminster Confession of Faith and the Reformed uh, believers uh, really take way out of context and miss uh, the entire meaning of the book of Romans for that matter. I don't know how you can miss it. Uh, and for that matter, uh, maliciously accuse God of uh, being phony, making invitations to people that, he, uh, that have no way of uh, responding to it. So I hope that we've learned enough about that to reject it. And if not, and we just uh, very superficial teachings on it, but uh, there's some books that you would definitely want to get this book for sure. What love is this? So if you're, if you're confronting Reformed theology, you really, this is a wonderful book. It's well annotated. Um, it's quotations from their own writings. That's very critical as far as uh, catching them in their own uh, theological webs. This is another good book called The Faith of God's Elect. And this one, very good, The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, which is fascinating. This gives us the history of how Calvin was just influenced by pagan thinkers, that's all. And uh, this is all mysticism, Eastern mysticism. It's fatalism. It goes all the way back to Egypt and Babylon. And uh, so all that happens is Augustine here uh, can't uh, detach himself from what he had learned as a young man and as an erudite philosopher. So he brings it over, tries to Christianize it. Impossible, can't be done. But that's how we ended up with the notion of that God uh, already picked ahead of time and uh, that everything is, uh, uh, fatalism is everything is already settled. There's no free will, man has no free will. It's one of the great contestable points in philosophy, by the way. Forget about just theology and uh, whether man has free will or not and what that do, uh, what are the, uh, encumbrances of the free will, what, uh, what is this all about? Does man, is man making his own choices and so on? Or is there some kind of fate that we must live by? So I know it's pretty hard on uh, folks that have commonly used the expression modern fatalism, it is what it is. And I, I recognize people use the expression because they pick it up from the world, frankly. And I think we all, we really always ought to look at where, where the source is for this information rather than just pick it up and say, that's a catchphrase, it sounds good, you know, because Mike Tomlin uses it in the Steeler interview, you know, it is what it is, Ben is what it is, Ben is being Ben, and this, you know, it's like Zen Buddhism, but um, best not to just follow after until you really know what this means, what am I saying, and what does it mean, after all, words have meanings, and they, uh, they derive from pagan thoughts, at any rate, as we've gone down in the, uh, in the chapter here, we're going to come really back to this notion of what Romans 8 is all about. It's a very triumphant book. It's all about faith in the Lord and exercising faith and our uh, wonderful opportunity to believe. And that's, that's been seen in all eight chapters. And when we get to this ninth chapter, we just have a few verses here that really uh, kind of stand out to us. And uh, what is this all about? Is there some kind of uh, pre-destiny that God has designed that people really don't have a choice at all? Just from those few verses, I'd have to say just, just the fact that they're, they're unusual verses, uh, that that is not what the tenor of Scripture is, and certainly isn't what the thing, thematic teaching of Romans is, as we'll see here, because we're gonna, going to actually get some explanatory verses now, where we get back to the notion of corporate election, where the nation Israel was corporately elected, as is the church of Jesus Christ. So we've used this expression at the earlier part of our studies, and now we're going to kind of revisit this now um, with the verse that's before us. All right, so we have the chosen people, and we have um, uh, what we call corporate election, which is uh, a group of people, and versus individual election, which is the suggestion that God uh, loves some and hates others, which is certainly nothing we should ever ascribe to our merciful Lord. So we have, we have uh, two great illustrations of this corporate election, and that's found in the, uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament concept and the chosen people of the Old Testament. And thankfully, the middle wall of perdition has now been broken down, and um, 
the only difference between Jew and Greek, and we use the word uh, from Galatians uh, in the third chapter that I think is very telling as well. Uh, the, the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, whether you're bond or you're free, whether you're male or female. So the idea is that uh, the, the only kind of persons that God sees are two types of people, saved or lost. Those that believe, those that reject. Uh, the seed of the virgin or the seed of the serpent uh, from Genesis 3. That's truly what this is all about. And so we're looking at, the, uh, at God who sees ahead of time and understands that there will always be a remnant of true believers. That his foreknowledge tells him. That there will always be some, as small as the number may be, that will continue to believe. Even in the chosen people, when uh, for the most part they were apostate and were under the wrath of God, there were always those like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, that were true believers. Uh, they may have been small in number, but God uh, looked upon them, and as Malachi tells us in the third chapter, he delights in hearing them uh, that fear the Lord and speak often of him one to another. And he says, I'll write them in my book. All right, so Romans 1.16 really tells the story uh, thematically of what the book of Romans is about. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Uh, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So the door is open to believe whether you're Jew or a Greek, whether you're male or you're female, whether you're bond, whether you're free. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's what the gospel and that's what the Bible truly is all about. So there you have it, everyone that believeth. That's the condition. And uh, those that believe will be his chosen people. Those that uh, choose Jesus will be the chosen. Those that elect to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be called the elect. Let's not make it any harder than that. So now our text, so even uh, us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Uh, as he saith, also in O.C. Now, this is just a Greek way of saying Hosea. Uh, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Now, here we have a veiled reference to what God was doing in opening the doors to the Gentiles and inviting people from every kindred tongue uh, and nation to believe and to become part of this corporate election and, and to uh, decide for the Lord Jesus Christ. So these were those that were not necessarily considered the people of God who became the people of God by exercising their choice, believing on the Lord. Now here's that verse that I had alluded to in Galatians chapter 3. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Boy, I'll tell you, the LGBTQ, WXYZ people, they really have a problem. They take this verse and say, see, it doesn't matter uh, what your sexual orientation is. That's not what this is teaching. I mean, really, read the context. You don't really even have to read the context. It's pretty obvious just from the single verse what he's talking about. He's talking about salvation, that God is no respecter of persons in regards to salvation. It doesn't matter if you're a Greek. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a master or whether you're a servant and a slave. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. He certainly isn't saying here it doesn't matter what you think you are. It, it matters if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have Jew and Gentile marvelously blended uh, through the cross with the middle wall of partition broken down between them and now one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians very clear to make the statement. Remember that Paul, a Jew, is writing to pagan Greeks at Ephesus who had been converted under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and Paul uh, received a lot of grief from the saints in Jerusalem who were all Jewish and believed that somehow you had to, you know, you had to be Jewish to actually be part of this corporate election. And though they were going right after Paul and uh, he'd go to one city and they'd follow after him and they'd tell the people, whatever he told you, you know, ignore that. And, and uh, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the dietary law. And here, you know, here are Greeks wondering, is this what we have, we have to keep the law to be Jews then? We have to become Jews. And Paul, of course, uh, came back and withstood them to the face. And he said, no, this doesn't belong to them. These are traditional laws that were fulfilled in Christ and there's no need uh, to keep 
keep the Sabbath days, the Passover days. There's no need to keep the dietary law. There's certainly no need for circumcision. All of these points have already been made here in the book of Romans. Remember what the dynamic is here. We have a church that is divided. They're divided because the Jews who founded the church were exiled. Uh, Caesar decided we don't want you anymore. Claudius Caesar uh, expels them from Rome and Nero brings them back. Uh, thanks, I suppose, in part to his wife, uh, Popea, who decides that she loves Jews. And so uh, she speaks and Nero also likes the money that Jews were bringing into the, uh, into the coffers. So bring them back in. And, but now they weren't received back in the congregation. Now these Gentiles believed in replacement theology and thought somehow that <laughs> the Jews are under condemnation and we're the chosen people now. And Paul is writing the epistle to correct that problem. And that's really what chapter 9 is all about, as a matter of fact. So, and we'll see uh, if we go back and revisit the third chapter, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. So that was the notion of it. Uh, it's the condition isn't being Jewish. The condition is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no difference, you'll say, when we get to the 10th chapter. 9, 10, and 11 must be read together, by the way, because uh, it is a part of this argument. And it's really the crux of the writing of the book of Romans. For there is no difference, he says, between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You all know the 13th verse, certainly. But see what comes before it here and understand what the issue is. So uh, we're all one in the body of Christ here. Uh, those that believe, uh, and the only way to become part of the body is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're a Jew or you're a Greek. So uh, that he might reconcile both uh, unto God in one body, both Jew and, and Greek. By the way, the expression Greek just refers to all other non-Jews. So if you will, in a national uh, ex expression, God sees Jew and others and puts all under this heading of Greek. The Jew and the Greek, that's the notion of it. So Jew and every other nation that's under the face of the earth. But here he says he, he's reconciled in his body uh, and brought them all together in one body by the cross having slain the enmity uh, thereby. So the enmity, this dynamic tension between the Jew and the Greek is resolved at the cross. It's all settled now. Brothers and sisters in Christ, under the blood of Jesus, we're all one in the body and baptized by one spirit into one body. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus by the gospel. Chapter 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling. And that's what the body of Christ is about. Now we're going to move on here in Romans 9. And you see here, Isaiah is brought to light here. Uh, and I'm putting a plug in for Sunday school if you don't come. I think you're missing a lot. Visions of Isaiah, very important teachings. But um, this ninth chapter of Romans, uh, Isaiah is quoted. He's quoted uh, throughout Paul's writings. He is uh, Paul's favorite quotations. And so much of what he writes, he doesn't always ascribe to Isaiah. So you have to know Isaiah and say, well, I know that, that uh, what he's saying there in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, he's really talking in, uh, in Isaiah expressions. But here he quotes him and he uses the again, a Greek way of saying Isaiah, Isaias, Isaias, Isaiah. Uh, Isaias also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. So th there's some debate about the word work there, uh, meaning word. It, it doesn't really make any difference in the text. So now we have the, the notion here of the remnant. I want to be focused on this because I think it's so very valuable and important to us. Of course Isaiah is speaking at his time and he's speaking to the circumstance that is right before him and unbeknownst to him it will have reference that now uh, goes well beyond the horizon of his writing. 
all the way down now to the writings of the Apostle Paul, and frankly, yet to be fulfilled in the last days of Earth's history in the hours of great tribulation. So, what is this referring to? And this, it behooves all of us, by the way, I highly suggest you get a reference Bible. Of course, there's no other Bible to use but a King James Version of the Bible. We're not going to get into all of that uh, debate now, but really it's the best and only translation you should use and just learn the English language. But if you get a Schofield Bible, you don't have to agree with all of his notes, but what you'll have, a very valuable thing that you have, is column references. And when you run into a place like this in Isaiah 9, you will have a column reference that will take you back to this actual place in the book of Isaiah. Then you can refresh yourself by reading the entire context from whence this was just extracted. And you begin to get a much better feel for what Paul is saying. Uh, much of what he's saying here, and I find this amazing, by the way, that he, he, he makes the quotation and says it without the, uh, the Greeks necessarily, or the Romans in this case, really understanding what went before it. They're not, uh, they're, they're not educated in the Old Testament, certainly, so uh, that he's bringing all this to light. Uh, but remember again that he has a mixed multitude. He's speaking to um, he's speaking to the Jews that are saved that are now being rejected by the the uh, Romans, and uh, so they would have understood this and they would have understood its context. Uh, those people poured over the Scripture and loved the Word of God. All right, so we'd have to go back uh, to our studies from the book of Isaiah, and you go to the eighth chapter, and you'll find here that I, Isaiah has two sons. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me, see that quotation is what Paul's using, uh, the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Uh, so we have two sons that were born, and uh, one son's name, is, and he is the younger, Meher Shalal Hashbaz. So, you know, forget looking through those books of what to name your son. You have a name right here. Anybody could call your son this. Of course, these names had great signification, as does ours today. When we name a, a child, we tend to look into the meaning of the name, and we try to find something that uh, would pro project the image that we're hoping our son or daughter might be. And that's normally uh, what people do when they choose a name, I think. Uh, but in the Old Testament, it was, it was always uh, ominous. There was something behind it. There was a message to be had. And uh, Meher uh, Shalal Hashbaz means swift to the spoil and quick to the plunder. Uh, so we're going to explain this in just a bit. If you were in Sunday school, this is nothing but review, right? This was uh, months ago. The eldest son was uh, Shi'ar Jashub, and his name meant a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. Now you're looking at your passage here in Romans and you want to try to put all this together. What's this about? The remnant returning. All right, so, so the, the first son actually is predicting what's going to ultimately happen, that God is going to bring his people back and restore them, even though they were under his anathema. They were disobedient people, We'll learn later that he was stretched forth his hands all day long to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Uh, and that's part of Isaiah's vision as well. Uh, but he's, he says, I'm, I'm going to bring you back because I've elected you as a people. Through you will come Emmanuel, God with you, in the midst of you. And our Emmanuel is coming through this chosen people. And so there will be a remnant. There won't, not all Israel is saved. But there will be a remnant of them that will be saved. That's why Paul is bringing this text now to light. All right, is everybody still with me? Because this could be a little dicey, I suppose. I'm taking a career risk here again. Okay. See in Isaiah 10, he says, The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, the mighty God. For uh, though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea. You see it here in Romans 9, right? Uh, yet a remnant of them shall return. Uh, the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So uh, there'd be a judgment, the consumption, and then uh, there'd be a return. And a remnant would return in righteousness. 
So Isaiah is plotting something that would happen in the immediate, and that would be, well, we all know that Samaria, the northern tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes that had uh, uh, seceded from uh, there was civil war essentially and there was a break at the time of Solomon after Solomon died and the Rehoboam and uh, Jeroboam were both um, uh, leaders of their own groups now and so there was kind of a civil division that took place and uh, immediately those that were of Samaria they had no temple now they had no priesthood in a sense so they established their own false religion and they were first to fall into apostasy and they were carried away captive by the Assyrians who came down and bludgeoned them and dragged them uh, through the streets and, uh, and enslaved them. A hundred some years later, um, Nebuchadnezzar would come then and he would come to Jerusalem and he would, uh, he would take Jerusalem away. Now, Jerusalem was saved for a number of reasons. Of course, God uh, was still upholding his promise to these people, but the, they too were very disobedient. They made covenants. Uh, with Assyria and paid Assyria gold, uh, you know, for protection, don't come down, take us away, and so on, that kind of thing. Even with Egypt, they make this covenant with the devil. And, uh, but it doesn't stand. And ultimately, Assyria says, when you run out of cash, we'll be down for you. And, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way it worked. And they kept coming to the doors, but God protected them many, many times. And hoping against hope that they would exercise the free choice that they were given to worship the Lord, but they didn't do it. And finally, under Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar comes down, takes them now captive, destroys their temple, burns the eyes of Zedekiah out, kills his princes before him, before he burns his eyes out, and then makes him a slave with all the people of Judah, and they're carried into Babylon. But Jeremiah said, uh, it'll only be 70 years. And so they remain there. And Isaiah's telling us this as well. The remnant shall return. And so the remnant will come back and come back. And they did in 70, after 70 years, they came back into Jerusalem, rebuilt the walls under Nehemiah and Ezra, and you know the accounts there and so on. So that's what the history is, that God, in other words, and what is Paul saying? God always leaves a remnant. And even with nationally Israel rejecting their Messiah and crucifying him, there's still a remnant of those that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 apostles. They were all Jews. Uh, there was a, a, a great revival at Pentecost where 3,000 Jews were saved. Next day, 5,000 are saved, then added daily after that. So we have this contingency of, of Jewish believers. And, uh, and, and the word then goes out even under the apostle Paul, who's Wherever he went, his pattern was to the Jew first, and he'd tell, go into the synagogues and he'd preach Christ uh, and, and prove that he was the Son of God, and, and uh, he was given audience. But then the Gentiles said, well, you have to tell us these things. We're interested. And uh, they would come back and hear the gospel, and then the jealousy between the Jew and the Greek and so forth that went on through the book of Acts. But God would always have a remnant of true believing Jews. And uh, so that's the promise that Isaiah is speaking about here. And um, from the beginning, Israel has been God's elect nation. So a nation whom God foreknew and a nation that God selected to be his people it has nothing to do with Jacob, loving Jacob and hating Esau as far as their salvation is concerned. He's talking about a people, the Edomites and uh, the, the Jews, the Israelites, so to speak. So here we see them. Here, they're, they're, it's a nation selected to be his people and selected to be their God. In the days of the prophet Elijah, God let it be known that he had left a remnant. According to 1 Kings 19, Elijah thought the nation Israel had totally departed from the living God. But God informed Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 18, that he had left for himself 7,000 knees that never bowed to Baal. Uh, that was God's remnant, 7,000. Uh, so during the days of the prophet Isaiah, God gave Isaiah a vision of Israel. The vision was totally um, told by Isaiah in Isaiah 119. Isaiah said that the nation had become a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are, that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have prov provoked the Holy One of Israel uh, unto anger. They are gone away backward. So Isaiah went on to say in verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant. 
we should have been as Sodoma and as Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, you see here, Paul's bringing all those verses together, you know, and kind of bringing it together to prove something. And that was that God has his hand upon Jews that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but that they weren't to become so arrogant to think that others weren't invited as well. They were to realize that Greeks also now have been invited because the door now has been opened to them. So in the book of Ezra records a remnant of Judah returning to the homeland after 70 years spent in Babylonian captivity, as was prophesied, so to speak, with uh, the two sons. The spoil had been taken and then the remnant would return. So Babylonian captivity, the reason they had been conquered by the Babylonians was their rejection of God. However, after 70 years prophesied in Jeremiah 29:10, God stirred up the heart of King Cyrus to allow the Jews to return to their homeland. Not all were interested in leaving the place where they had lived for two generations, but a remnant was moved by God and returned to the land where the Jews reestablished their worship to God and ultimately rebuilt the temple. Now in the New Testament, it tells us in Romans 11, uh, 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So again, it's national corporate election that he's talking about, not individuals. Today, the church serves as God's chosen people. And like the children of Israel, the church has become a sinful nation comprised of believers laden with iniquity. They are a seed of evildoers with children uh, that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord and have provoked the Holy One unto anger. They have gone away backward, but despite the state of the church, God has once again left a small remnant, a remnant that is far from perfect, but a remnant that trusts God. And so, and they come to church on Sunday nights, don't they? So, I <laughs> hope you all feel good about yourselves. A remnant of believers in the midst of all this apostasy that sickens me and certainly sickens God. Uh, so he's going to spit it out of his mouth. But that doesn't mean that he's forsaken his promise. There will always be the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It may be small in number, but they are indeed, and the position that they hold as the elect of God, the chosen of God, uh, is something that can never be brought down. God will keep his word. And so he says, and he quotes again, Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Lord of hosts, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and had been like unto Gomorrah. So all that comes to play here in the book of Romans, interestingly enough, these quotations. And what's the point of it is that he's bringing this all together in the end of his arguments. And so we're coming to the end of the chapter here where, you know, we, we really have gone through a lot of information and hopefully we're beginning to see how it, it is uh, uh, gelling together and we begin to see it. So wherefore, because they sought, to, sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law. So now he's talking about with the Jews that uh, have rejected and those that do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are cast aside just as certainly as that was the case throughout Jewish history. Just because they were Jewish doesn't give them a ticket to heaven. Wherefore? Well, because they, they didn't work by faith. They thought it would be the works of the law that would save them. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now we've come to what we call the peroration or the, the end of Paul's argument in this ninth chapter. And uh, what a glorious ending it is, so to speak. Now, of course, we're going to move right into the tenth chapter, which reasserts all these truths. But now he, he brings to light this, this uh, symbol, so to speak, that Jesus is the, the stone and the rock of offense and a stumbling stone. And this explains to a great degree the dynamic at, at Rome here with the Jew and the Gentile and so forth. Now he quotes here, and it's an oft quote, uh, often quoted from Psalm 118. Peter quotes it as well. He says uh, in the second chapter, the fourth through the eighth verse, to whom coming as unto a a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion. There it is again, a chief cornerstone. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So, uh, well, we know that this is Jesus, the great cornerstone of our faith. 
our life is built upon it. Jesus said, if any man hear my teachings, uh, I will liken him unto a man that buildeth his house on a rock. The winds came and the, uh, the floods came and beat against the house. And the house stood because it was founded on a rock. Jesus is the great cornerstone of our faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <coughs> verse 10, no foundation is laid than that which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. So we don't have to wonder what this symbol is all about. It's rather explanatory. So he is the great stone. And of course, those that reject him, he's a stumbling stone to them. Peter continues, he says, unto therefore which uh, you believe, unto uh, you therefore which believe he is precious but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Again, we can get all jumbled up with this idea, well, were they appointed? But they had a will, and they exercised their will, but God knew what they would do, just as he knew what Pharaoh would do, and so he would ultimately use all of this and foretell it to warn us, so that we knew ahead of time that God was well aware of how men would exercise their free will for a very bad choice. We did this study a while ago as well, but I think it's worth repeating the study of the stone. Wherever I look in the Bible, I see these, these images, you know, and they're wonderful threads that you can follow through. Uh, I think some of you have a Thompson Chain reference Bible, don't you? And if you have a Thompson Chain, you know, they got some, he's got some glorious uh, threads that you can run through there as well. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a great choice as well for a reference Bible. So we have Joshua, you know, he wrote these words in the book of the law. Um, took a great stone and he set it up there by the oak tree that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Now you know uh, this is what we call what personification. So uh, we're ascribing to a stone uh, human quality. It's just a literary device. But there's something about a stone, obviously. Uh, a stone uh, has endurance. It's known for its endurance. Long after other things uh, live and then perish, the stone will always be there. Uh, and that's why when we bury someone, we put a, a headstone and uh, you choose granite because granite is, is the hardest of stones and you put that up and you intend uh, to etch whatever little saying in it and so on and th that's a forever experience. That's the idea of it. And it becomes a witness or we might call it an Ebenezer as a matter of fact. So here Joshua said, I'm going to set up this stone and this stone or a style will be a reminder uh, and a memorial. Why uh, you can look in almost every borough and every township, they'll have uh, usually some sort of a monument to the soldiers of World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, and sometimes they even try to add the later conflicts, the Vietnam conflicts and so forth. This, just like we do at Memorial Day, is so that we don't forget the sacrifice that has been made. The stone stands as a witness. When others may forget, the stone will be there to remind us. And that's why Joshua sets the stone up at this point and says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Well, Joshua didn't know John Calvin or Augustine, I suppose. So he said, choose, make your choice. You know, <laughs> He didn't realize that they couldn't, you know, that they were dead in sins and trespasses. <laughs> so obviously he believed in free will as I do. And as if you read the Bible, you'll see it everywhere. Choice has to be made. And then you have, of course, in Samuel, the, that strange word that I already used, Ebenezer. The only way you would know it is because Charles Dickens made it famous by naming Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. But you want to know what the word means and how it actually came into common parlance. And that was in 1 Samuel. You'll find that Samuel took a stone and set between Mizpah and Shen. And he called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The Lord is our helper, Ebenezer. And uh, hey, that's a positive. Nobody names their son Ebenezer because of what Dickens did to the name. But really, it's a, it's a grand name, Ebenezer. And the notion, of course, is that it reminds us of how God has helped us. In Romans chapter 5, we remember 
uh, that patience worketh experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. What do we learn? Through uh, tribulations, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. So the whole idea is that you go through life and you realize that God has always been there for you. God has helped you through all sorts of calamities. And uh, he is your, uh, you need an Ebenezer to remind you of his faithfulness that's new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, right? So uh, there's the stone again, a reminder. Jesus is the stone, isn't he? He's the Ebenezer. He's our great helper. Even when he was leaving this earth, he said, I'm not going to leave you helpless. I'm going to send to you another comforter and he's going to abide with you. He shall be in you. We'll remember that Jacob uh, went to sleep on a rock, didn't he? And uh, he didn't know about Mike Lindell's pillow, my pillow, but he, so he was out in the wilderness. What could he do? So he puts his head upon a rock. This place will be called Bethel, the house of God. And as he's sleeping, this great vision, he sees uh, a ladder that reaches up into heaven and angels ascending and descending upon it. And uh, when he awakes, it's a fearful but a wondrous experience that he has. He pours oil upon the, that stone and he says, truly, this is the house of God. So uh, in a sense, because he received such a glorious revelation, he called that the gate of heaven, right? The house of God. Uh, so it became his Bethel and he returned to it uh, later on. We rest also upon the Lord. And because we rest upon the Lord, he opens to us visions. And we understand things in a sense that are miraculous and spiritual. And we understand things not from the common level. We assess everything uh, from the divine. We begin to understand that everything has a spiritual significance in what happens. You also see in Exodus chapter 20 that when uh, they were given orders to make the sacrifice in the wilderness, that they would take stones, but those stones couldn't be hewn stones. They had to be taken straight from its element. And to make the altar of stone, thou shalt not build of it of hewn stone, for if thou lift thy tool upon it, it shall be polluted. So that was the notion. Well, of course, where does the Lamb of God come into this picture? He's put uh, upon the altar, isn't he? So we see the lamb placed upon the stone altar, uh, which of course uh, now unites the imagery of Jesus, the lamb of God, the sacrifice uh, for our sins. Well, of course, remember that uh, Moses was given two tables of stone and in it, the finger of God writes the holy commandments and the moral laws of God. We see also that when David goes into the Valley of Elah uh, to uh, gain victory over the giant twice his size. He takes with him stones, right? He has five smooth stones, by the way. Uh, but only one is necessary to defeat the giant in that hour. But what a type of Christ that is. Jesus will come again and smite the Gentile powers that now rule over the chosen people. And he'll establish his kingdom forever. Jesus, while he was here on earth, spoke of this. And he said, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. Uh, it shall be thrown down. Therefore, say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. It's very interesting here. What Isaiah said uh, in his passages, and now what uh, Paul is saying as well, is, you know, that these that are not a people will be called the children of God. People that had no promise are now brought into the promise. Uh, God, uh, he said, you've rejected the kingdom, at least nationally, and so you'll be outside of the kingdom. And they'll come from the east and from the west and the north and the south, and they'll come into the kingdom and you'll find yourselves cast out, Jesus said. Uh, so it was very clear what was happening there. And of course, when Jesus is viewed in heaven, he's seen as a stone, a sardine stone and a jasper stone. And uh, gleaming with a great brilliance. And John is taken in by the beatific vision. Uh, and he sees Christ in all of his glories. But he sees him again as, as a glorious gem. Highly polished with light refle re re reflecting from him. And from within and out of him. Uh, in a glorious effulgence. And uh, you and I of course will marvel at this sight. When first, what, what the few seconds that we leave this body. And we're ushered into the presence of of the King of Kings, just as John was, we'll marvel as he did marvel at that moment. 
Um, and of course, the stone that Daniel speaks about that would be cut out of the mountain, the kingdom of God, and would come down and smite the Gentile image and then itself become a, a, a mountain that fills the entire earth, the kingdom, the universal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, the smiting stone. And so when Jesus was born, he would be a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Joseph had nothing to do with his birth. Mary, very little to do with his birth other than uh, opening her womb uh, by an act of volition and choice. Be it unto me according to thy word. The angel does not violate Mary. She has a choice to receive the blessing. She said, be it unto me according to thy word. And so uh, Jesus, the stone cut out without hands, Mary and Joseph really have nothing to do with his conception at this point. So uh, that's the word that becomes flesh and dwells among us. We behold the glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, we have this, this terrible judgment of the stone coming down, this stumbling stone that would come, uh, people would stumble over him as they do. You have relatives that are stumbling over this. No interest at all in the gospel. You can try to get them to church. Every once in a while we'll corral them, right? And we say, oh, you know, you're gonna come. it's friend day, right? We've got to bring you. You're my friend, aren't you? And you would do everything we can. And uh, why do we wield them and cajole them and hope, hope somehow that we're going to get them here in hopes to hear the, that they might hear the gospel? Their heart would be liberated from the chains that Satan has bound them with and that they, they might have that quickening ray diffused from heaven itself and that they would be liberated and they would become free people finally. It happened to us, we think it could happen to them as well. And that's why we encourage them and that's why we do what we can and that's why we, we, we try to evangelize. We certainly believe that man has a free choice and that he needs to make it for Christ. Uh, elsewise, well, whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. In other words, their life now, they fall upon the rock and they say, Lord, uh, rebuild my life. I build my life now upon you. I, I, I'm, I'm melted into your presence and so on. But if it falls upon you, it'll grind you to powder. So uh, we want to make sure whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. So... All right, so we end the chapter here, and uh, I don't think you could end it any better way. Here are, the, here are these telling me that chapter 9 tells the whole story about election, that God has already figured it out before they were born and so on, and there's nothing that you have to do with it, and uh, your will is dead and corrupt, and you're a dead person, and you, there's no way you can respond to the gospel, that God will have to regenerate you for you to be saved, for you to believe. <laughs> so that's, that's what they do. They contort all of this. But how does the Bible end here? Or how does this chapter end at any rate? But it ends with the very concept of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, uh, well, the notion of it is to be saved and to, uh, to receive him at the end. And whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed. Whosoever believeth. Now, those are precious words, aren't they? Oh, they're so familiar, Pastor. Well, of course they are because they're found in the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him. We see this goes on and on and on. It is unmistakable, ineluctable. Wherever you go in the Bible, you see the same formula. It all has to do with God's desire to save and man's willingness to believe it. Whosoever believeth. So how can we negate all of that? Whosoever believeth and take all of those passages that say such a thing. Here's 1 John 5. John loves using this expression, by the way. He uses it over 75 times in his gospel and the epistles. Whosoever believeth. Uh, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Very clear right here. 
uh, this is a wonderful invitation. Uh, I quoted this already. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. It's all about what you choose to believe. He, uh, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. But men love darkness rather than light because the deeds are evil. He that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. You see, the, the will is still active here. It's not that he can't come to the light. He won't come to the light. His uh, deeds are more important. His sinful life is more important to him than, than to be saved. And as a result, he dies in his sins. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. In other words, we've taken them to the cross. And that God worked out the, the plan of salvation by his bringing our sins to him. Because there wasn't anything we could do about it. We had to bring it to Christ. And Christ does the work in our behalf if we believe. It's all conditional. So, um, oh, I already mentioned 75 times you're going to find it. Uh, this idea of belief throughout the, the Gospel of John and the writings of John and so forth. But whosoever believeth, what, what a wonderful thing and what a refreshment it is to the soul to hear it. So we end the chapter with the idea, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And he's going to repeat it in the 10th chapter uh, in the 12th verse. It's going to say the same thing. Uh, but he reminds us whether it's a Jew or a Greek, it, it, it's the same to God. It's a whosoever believeth. That's the condition. So forget uh, that you're a male or a female. Forget that you're a Jew or a Greek. Forget that you're a bond or you're free. Forget whatever you think you are. And we're going to draw this wonderful vertical line right down the middle and say you're either saved or you're lost. You're a sheep or you're a goat. So whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And what does he, he challenges Martha to believe this. Believest thou this? You see, the question is posed. Uh, so Martha has to make up her mind, do you believe this? If you believe this, you'll make a confession of faith that you believe him. And of course, Martha was struggling with something there at that point. Uh, what was Jesus suggesting? We're going to actually raise a four-day-old dead, uh, four dead man from the tomb? She'll make the protest, uh, don't open the tomb. But oh, how glad she was after they opened it. John 12, he says, I am come as a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Then, of course, this theme is carried through the scripture. This isn't something that's just, uh, you know, foreign to the rest of the Bible that's germane only to the gospel of John. No, no, no. The formula is seen everywhere. So in the book of Acts, to him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. So, whosoever believeth in him. Romans 9 is our passage here. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means when we stand before God and we hope for salvation, well, our trust, we, we won't be ashamed that we trusted the wrong thing in that hour. There'll be a lot of people with their rosary beads and whatever else and their list of good works and all the things that they had done and the donations that they made and all the rest. And they're all standing in line hoping this, will, this, this should be enough, but they'll be ashamed when they stand before the king. That won't be enough to save them. Uh, so uh, Isaiah said, you know, the, uh, the bed is too short and the covering is not long enough. Uh, so so what, they're trying to cover themselves with something that they cannot cover their sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, as we sang here tonight. Then Romans 10, 11, of course, for uh, as the scripture saith, uh, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And then we can go to 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So I'd have to say, listen, take the Bible and read the Bible as a whole book. And if you just want to take a few isolated verses out, you can get all caught up in a lot of strange thoughts that are really not biblical thoughts at all. And this whole notion of Calvinism is totally unbiblical. Now, I guess I need to say in defense is that the, I don't believe that Calvinists are lost. I think they just are teaching something that is aberrant. And as far as I'm concerned, it's insulting. It insults the grace of God. It insults the motive of God. 
that you would suggest that God is some kind of a mountebank, a corrupter that says, um, well, I'm going to make you a promise, but I know you, you can't respond to it. I'm going to invite you to be saved, but I know you can't be saved uh, because you're dead in your sins and trespasses. I, I don't think that this is the God of the Bible that I'm reading about, a God who is generous and merciful and long-suffering and patient to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that when Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, I don't think he, he made a, a pretentious uh, promise that no one could fulfill. I believe that we have a genuine invitation and the last words of the Bible tell us, whosoever will let him come and drink freely of the water of life. So Lord, um, pray that uh, we've gone through, a, I think, a difficult place in the scripture, uh, one that is highly contested. And frankly, Lord, the preponderance of Bible scholars stand with the Calvinists. So um, we feel somewhat uh, lonely but then again, so did uh, Elijah. And we're sure, Lord, that there are many uh, good preachers throughout the country that do not hold to this position and understand what the Bible is plainly saying. But Lord, we, uh, we have to defend the truth and I pray that we'll uh, go away better students as a result. We'll be able to defend what the true scripture says and certainly we want to encourage lost people to come to you. We don't want to come with a defeatist attitude. I don't even imagine that people holding uh, the position of predeterminism and uh, believe that it's already settled have any motivation to go and reach people with the gospel. How could they? It doesn't matter whether they preach or they don't preach. Uh, and just the opposite here, Lord, where you invite us with the Great Commission to go and preach the gospel to every creature. It must mean that every creature has an opportunity to believe or reject it. So, Lord, I pray if there's anyone in the room that has not believed on the Lord Jesus, that they would do that this moment. They would become true followers of the living God, that they'd put away sin, and that they would walk by faith every day of their lives, that we will grow in grace, and that you will help us, Lord, uh, on our road of sanctification. No one here has arrived at perfection. We're just pilgrims on the, on the pathway, Lord. We want to learn more. We want to grow stronger. Now, Lord, remember our nation that's in great peril. Uh, Lord, we have those that rule over us that are tyrants. There are those, Lord, that are unbelievers. They are enemies of righteousness and truth, Lord. And they um, make uh, mischief by a law. I, I pray for them, Lord. The, I pray for their conversion. I pray for light to come to President Biden and Kamala Harris and uh, for the cabinet and uh, all these various people, Lord, that uh, now have power positions, homosexuals that are in power, homosexuals that flaunt their uh, gay spirit uh, with pride parades and uh, openly flaunt the Word of God. Bring them to deep convictions, Lord. Down deep in their soul, they know that this is wrong and they need to repent and need to come out of this uh, perverse lifestyle. We pray, Father, for those that want to kill their babies. We've got half of our country that apparently believes in this. And we're just praying, Father, that uh, you'd give conscience to people that seemingly have been burned with a hot iron. Revive them, Lord. Uh, it's not your will that they perish. We marvel at your long suffering, Lord. You're waiting, obviously, for some of them to come to the light. We're glad you waited for us, Lord. Now bring some others. We pray, Father, that we can do your work this week. Help us, Lord, with the hardened hearts. Uh, we meet so many of them, Lord. Hearts that are just encrusted with unbelief. They have been supported by the media. They've been supported uh, by the school and the classroom and the teachers, Lord, and uh, their fellows and their peers, Lord. And it's difficult now for us to, to uh, bring the light to them. They, they seem to uh, be repulsed by it. Uh, some of them run away from it. They just don't want to hear it. And I pray, Lord, uh, they're still alive, they're still breathing, there's still the opportunity. So we pray that we might be able to give them the light and that they would receive the light. So encourage our hearts, Lord, help us to continue in your work. Open up opportunities day by day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. 
There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thank you.